Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Okay, let's see if I can let you in, Carlos. <laughs> you want to okay, I'm letting John in. Craig, want you I will. Yeah, you're the lawyer. Yeah. And let's see. Who else is it with us? Me, you see me? Okay. So let's see. Yeah, beautiful. Are they brown? Are they gonna be brown? Um that's Okay, I'm going to invite you, Carlos, because I don't see you, and I don't know why. Hang on. Six months before he died. What's that say? We had a sign card. Okay. Okay. Somebody's iPad. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Let's see. Here, punch in your number. So they hosted me in. You don't see me at all? Good morning, Gabby. Good morning, Sunday, March 7th. I think all of back. Good morning. We're just getting our technical difficulties rolled out here. Who do we have here joining us to this morning? Say your name, please. Robert. Well, Robert's in the room. Oh, we have a guest. John Fernald. We have John Fernald. John, we've got John on board here. The bottom line. Click on the loop, right? Should be. Let's see what the date's going. It should be zoo. There it is. Okay. It says March Peter, 7th. Peter. All right. So can you phone me? So I have to invite Mr. Carlos here. Hang on. Okay. You're going to read to me a new link or just? Yeah. Just Punch in your number here. Here, right here. What's my number? Yeah, say it. I don't know why. You don't know your phone number? 619. It's going to go to your message. 396. Okay. 9287. Hey, Tom. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Say hi. Mayor Bill Tom. Terrific. Tom, okay, got it. Bill, very nice okay. to meet you too. All right. We're just getting everybody on board. My name's Kathy. Carlos is on the room. Okay. We're on about two minutes. Okay, we're here. And who else do we have here this morning? Perfect. We have Mayor Bill Will. Bill Wells in the room. He's our speaker this morning. And we have Nikki. Oh, and we have two more visitors. Look at that. I like that. And I'm gonna let you say your name, please. I'm David Martin. David Martin and Marcos. And we got Nikki in the back and Craig. And say your name, sir. Tom Skank. Tom. Okay. And Robert and Carlos. And I'm Catherine Lasota. And we're gonna open in prayer here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we could be together, Lord. I just thank you for their goodness and your mercy. And thank you for Skyline Church allowing us to have this class so that we can learn. As entrepreneurs for Christ, we all need knowledge and wisdom, Lord. And I know it comes from above. It comes from you. But you have used each one of us in important ways, Lord. And I just pray that we can be conduits for your goodness and mercy. We pray for those that aren't involved this morning that that might want to be and just encourage them, Lord. And for those far away, Lord, we pray for healings and travel mercies for those possibly coming to us and visiting in person. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, ladies and gents.
And I'm gonna let Mayor Bill Wells have the floor. And I believe, Carlos, you invited him, right? And, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's, I'll get it for you. And thank you again, everyone. Thank you again. If you have any trouble hearing, please let us know. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. How's it going? So, uh, Carlos asked me to prepare about three or four hours worth of material. Good. And uh, so, I hope you're settled in. This is probably more like what, half an hour? Two Okay, to 11 o'clock. Well, this is great to see you all. Um, and I, I'm really curious to find out about all your businesses. I, I, might, I also own a business. And, uh, being, being the mayor of a city pays about enough to uh, make a decent car payment. So I, 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 I have to, uh, I, I have a, a company that uh, provides psychology and psychiatry services to federally qualified health clinics. So that keeps me busy when I'm not working as the mayor. But I think the thing that probably interests you is my uh, experience of being the mayor of the city of El Cajon. And I started in, in city government in 2004. And I, I, the last time I was here, I told that story about how I got it. It was uh, an interesting way for me to get in the government. I never expected to get in the government. Um, it was really the result of us having a family emergency and <clears throat> kind of losing everything at, in 2003. And my wife going in the closet and praying and kept coming out with the answer to prayer was that I was supposed to run for office, which I said, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. And I don't want to do that and tell God, no. My wife uh, is, a, is a persistent woman. And she kept after me until I finally uh, started making some inquiries about running for office, completely against my will. And the, the doors opened up, I immediately got on city council. And then after that, I was appointed the mayor, and then I ran twice for mayor. And so I've, I've been the mayor since uh, 2013. And it's been quite an experience. Uh, a lot of people talk about how negative it must be because they, I, I get a lot of pushback on my beliefs and ideas and stands on things. But frankly, um, it, it's not a hardship really at all. I, I really like it. The people that criticize me and attack me, I know that they don't really know me and they don't, they develop a caricature of what they think I am and they attack that caricature, but they don't really know me at all. And the things they attack me about are always so far off base. I know when people call me a racist <laughs> and, and I, you know, I say, if you, know my, if you knew my life, it would be impossible to say that, but those kind of things happen when you're a public guy, you, you kind of learn to deliver. But I think the, the story that's probably most interesting in terms of the, this class would be shortly after I uh, became mayor, I woke up one night, and I'm not saying metaphorically, but literally woke up one night and thought to myself, I have been given a tremendous opportunity. And if I don't do something with this, my time will pass and I'll leave office and I'll immediately have regrets saying I didn't do enough about what God gave me to do. And um, at the same time, I, I had been reading a book called Destined to the Throne, which I, I know some of you know Pastor Garland. Imagine you all know Pastor Gurla. Yes. Uh, I asked I asked Pastor Gurla what uh, books I should read. He, that, was, that was his top one. So I read Destiny for the Throne. Destiny for the Throne is a book about prayer. And it was kind of apropos to the sermon we just had. And in that book, it kind of totally changed my idea about prayer. I, I always thought prayer was kind of a silly thing. It, it didn't make any sense to me. We're, we're talking about a God who knows everything, who knows all the things I think and all the things I'm going to do. So, you know, I get my little prayer time and I say, oh God, please help my business and please help my kids and please help my health. And 
you know, I, I know God honors that, but at the same time, he already knew all that before I said that. So it, to me, it's from a transactional point of view, it seemed kind of pointless. But when I read the book, Destiny for the Throne, the author explained to me that prayer is kind of like on-the-job training. Uh, God eventually wants us to go through this life, learn as much as we can, graduate to heaven, and then at some point, we become co-managers. Um, we, 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 we work in conjunction with God to do whatever he has for us next. And we don't really know what that is. But I don't believe that, you know, we when you talk about going to heaven and sitting on clouds and stroking hearts, I, I don't think that's what, what it's all about. I think we're going to have lots of challenges to do in heaven. So the way the author described prayer was it was like on-the-job training. And then it was not only something that God wanted us to do, but it was, act, it was an actual requirement. If he was going to get involved in our lives, if he was going to make changes, you know, the kind of changes I wanted him to make in my life, I had to interact with him and, and talk with him and work with him. And so that was about the same time I became mayor of the city in 2013. And I remember waking up that night thinking, I've got to do something for, for the people of Oklahoma. And, you know, the, the normal things that, that people do when you're in office, and the things I've done as well, is uh, try to bring more business in, try to increase, try to uh, pass ordinances that make the city more livable, you know, clean up homelessness and clean up the parks and make sure the streets are not, not having any potholes and make sure the um, you know, we're changing out the old lights or LED lights, a lot of boring things that nobody really cares about, but they're important. But I felt that there was, had to be something more than that. And, and I realized that being a Christian and being the mayor of a city was an opportunity, but a scary opportunity. Because if you started bringing your Christian faith into the public arena, what's going to happen? People are going to think that's great, or they're going to really think that's the stupidest thing that they've ever heard. And it, it just became very clear to me that I had to stand. I had to get over worrying about my position, and over worrying about what's going to happen in the next election, and just do the right thing, which is a lot harder than it sounds. It, it's really easy to sit back and and look at people and say they should just do the right thing. But when you're actually in the position, there's all kinds of people whispering in your ear, if you do that, that's political suicide. You're never gonna get elected again. And people are gonna say you're stupid. And people are gonna say that you're ignorant and you don't know science and blah, blah, blah. We've, we've heard all the arguments. But I decided that I, I was gonna do the right thing no matter what. So first thing I did, was I asked people to come up to Mount Helix on January 1st every year. The first thing we did would be to pray for our city. And basically give the city to God. And we, we go on Mount Helix so we can see the city, reach out over the city and pray for, for the people. And not, not just the government, but pray for all the single moms and pray for all the, the, the homeless folks and pray, pray for all the people starting with drug and alcohol problems. Pray, pray for the people who deal with domestic violence problems or lack of income problems, you know, all the things that, that people deal with. And when I first did it, I, I took a lot of heat. People came to council meetings and ridiculed me because they uh, they said, well, how stupid is that? Well, what are you accomplishing? You And they gave, they gave kind of a weird either or scenario. They, they said, instead of wasting your time praying, why aren't you fixing the streets and getting, you know, fixing the homeless problem? And I thought, well, you know, it's not like it's not like a, you know, you say a prayer and everything goes out, else goes out the window. You don't lose your, you can't use your brain. But you know how people are; they're very hostile. Right? And, and then we, after we did that, we started that the first year, and it was kind of a neat experience. It, it definitely felt like the right thing to do. And I thought well, we need to expand this, so we started this thing called the Forty Days of hope. And we 
worked with all the churches to 24 hours a day have somebody on he's praying for the city for four days and um more ridicule more angry people coming to city council meetings you're separate you, you're not adhering to the separation of church and state you know what about the uh, what about the muslims what about the hindus and i said well if they want to pray then they should pray too i mean yeah uh, it's okay with me i it's a, this is not an exclusive thing but you know the the churches wanted to do this so we let them do it so again we just took nothing but ridicule but i want to tell you some interesting things that happen as a result of it. and we did this consistently we do this every year we do the 40 days of hope and we do the praying for the city on at mount helix and i think some interesting things that happen as a result and I'll let you be the judge. Maybe, maybe it's just coincidence, but maybe not. First thing was, I was really concerned about the first 40 days because I wanted to, I wanted to see something tangible happen as a result. Because frankly, I, you know, I was getting beat up pretty bad by the by the atheistic secular humanist community for for doing this. And it's interesting. God showed up on the 39th day of the 40 days of hope the f street bookstore and downtown el cajon closed and took their signs down for the first time in 50 years and now that could be a coincidence but i don't think so in fact that, that was really the, re, the beginning of, of a regeneration of that whole downtown area which now is kind of an art district there's about Eight, where the F Street Bookstore was, there's about eight different art studios and, and some restaurants and art cutting places. It's, it's a nice little downtown area. It's certainly very clean and it's a lot safer. <laughs> Praise the most of God. Amen. But there, let me give you one more example and then I'll answer questions. So I don't know if you remember, um, everybody remember. For, the Ferguson riots after, you know, I, most people remember that was that was the first of the Black Lives Matter type riots that really started gripping the the country in you the, well, a few times. Yeah, um, they were that was right out uh, during the Obama administration was when when the government really took a stand that uh, maybe riots were justified and that uh, people people should be able allowed or even encouraged to riot and burn their cities. And so it happened in Ferguson and it happened in uh, Baltimore, happened in Dallas, a couple other towns. And then one day in the midst of all that, I went to uh, a city council meeting and I was, I wasn't late, but I was close. It, the city council meeting starts at three o'clock and I walk in at about 2.58. And waiting for me at the back door is my city manager. I, I, I see him waiting for me when I come. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> Give me a little break. I'm not late. You know, it just, it's just, you know. And he's waiting. He's obviously very impatient to talk to me. I'm like, okay. You know. And I said, hey, Doug, what's going on? He said, we have a shooting. We have a a shooting. Shoot. Yeah. I, I said, what happened? He said, there was a, oh, one second. There was a, um, an unarmed black man that was causing a disturbance, and he made a gesture that he was going to shoot a police officer. The police officer shot him, and my heart sunk to the floor. I thought, this is the worst possible time, the worst possible thing that could happen. They're going to be busing people into our town to burn us down. Because remember, my point of reference at that point was every other city this is happening. Uh, there were riots. There were there were people killed, police cars torched, businesses torched, windows broken, and I could just in a fraction of a second I saw the whole scene before my eyes. Well, what was going to happen to us in the next forty-eight hours? So um, we went and looked at the tape. Uh, it should, we didn't have a tape of it, but. At that point, we didn't have uh, body-worn cameras on our police officers. We have them now, but at that point, we didn't have those. 
but somebody from the drive in Mexican restaurant right next to where it happened saw it all happening. They, they taped it on their iPhone and they gave us the, they, they sent us the clip of the iPhone. Thank God we had that tape because otherwise, who knows what would have happened because people told stories. So I looked, I was up in the command center at the police department. I looked at the tape and the tape was really, really clear. He, this guy was very agitated. He went to his pocket, he got to the stance, he pulled out a black object with a silver barrel. It looked like a gun to me. And he went like that. So the police officer, the police officer shot him. What it was, was a, um, a cell phone charger. No, 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 a vapor. One of those, one of those vapors, a big charging thing for a vape. And the, the, the metal barrel was the vape itself. And then it, it plugged into the charging unit, but the whole thing looked like a gun. Is this suicide by yes. police? Exactly right. So um, so about five o'clock in the afternoon, I looked at that tape. And then I was trying to figure out what to do. I got into my car and I was driving to meet my wife. We were we had already made previous plans to meet for dinner. And in the car, I listened to the radio, and I heard somebody on the radio say, Yeah, I saw the whole thing. He was begging for his life, and the police officer just said, he said, too late, I'm gonna kill you, and shot him. And um, it sounded horrible, but I also had just seen the tape. I saw exactly what happened. It, he was not begging for his life. He was not trying to get away. He was, he confronted the officer in a shooting stance. Was that CNN? Oh, I, I don't even know at that point. Uh, it, I think it was a local station. Because it was, it was on the radio, but the thing, the whole thing escalated very quickly, and um, we had people being busted in from Chicago and LA, gangbangers that were that were brought in. And the story goes on and on. I, I won't bore you with all the details. You can ask questions if you'd rather, but just suffice it to say that it was a rocky road. Um, I had, I had a conflict with the district attorney. Uh, the district attorney said that I was not allowed to release that, that videotape. Um, and she, she claimed jurisdiction over the videotape. And I had the NAACP. I brought the NAACP and the Urban League into my office. I said, hey guys, I want you to stand with me. Let's do something different this time. Let's not let the city burn. Let's all stand together and, and we won't condemn anybody, but we'll just we'll stand together and try to make this stop before it happens because it's not good for anybody. And they said, well, we'll do that, but you have to release the videotape. And I kind of think that they did, that it was kind of one of those uh, empty, empty promises in the sense that they, 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 knew, they knew I wasn't going to release the videotape, so they went ahead and offered it up as a negotiating point. But I really wanted them to come stand up with me. Had they seen the videotape? No, they so had. thought it was incriminating. They, they didn't know, but you know, they had a good point. They, they said, you know, you're saying that the, the, the shooting was justified. But until we see it, you know, why can't we? Why can't we see it? Well, what is, what is the district attorney? What, what, that's not her call. Well, where where am I missing? Yeah, there's. It, I was going to skip over that part, but I'll, the attorney in the room will make me explain it, um, which is why. Um, so about six months before this happened, um, we had signed and agreed with the, with the DA and. All the cities had that because these Ferguson things were happening, that we agreed that so we weren't pressured to release videotapes, that all videotapes would go to the DA and the DA would then release the videotapes. So I called Bonnie and I said, we got to release that tape. And she was um, she was not particularly polite with me and uh, she, she no, Bonnie wasn't. Yeah. Really. And she disagreed with me. Bonnie Dumanis? Yeah. 
And um, I said, well, I'm going to release it anyway. And I said, you can sue me, you know, if that's what you want to do. But I, I think that's I think that's what we have to do. So we released the tape. And then I called the guys on the end of the ACP and the urban league to come and scan with me. And I brought in Pastor Miles McPherson from the Rock Church. And we all worked together. Interesting happened. For the first time in the history of this BLM type situation, we didn't violence. We had three weeks of protesting in the streets. Every night we had 500 cops on the streets every night full riot gear. But they just couldn't get the, the looting and the burning started. These guys from Chicago and the LA were, were trying to get it going. We had undercover cops in the crowd every night. Between great police work and good integration with uh, African American leaders in, in the in the town. But I think more importantly, because we had now at that point had a five year history of putting the town up in prayer, uh, giving, giving the town to God, mm -hmm. asking for God to, to reside, be part of our, our decision making process and to be part of everything we were doing. I think God honored us and Amen. gave us the, the opportunity to get through that. Now it's a little it's a little frustrating because um, there's no way to prove that, and people aren't going to remember it that way. They're going to they're going to they probably won't remember it at all because we didn't have a lot of it. But I know what happened, and uh, I think it was important that you all know it too. And at this point, I'll just open it up for any questions that you if I have about anything that interests you. I remember seeing you on TV. Do a protest. Is that that time period? And yep. you also went to Fox News and other places? Yeah, I did a lot of national news and local news. And basically, interestingly enough, I, one of the other reasons that all worked out was that um, Miles McPherson uh, was a good mentor to me at that part because, you know, there, there are racial blinders, I think, that. that as, as, a, as a white guy, and even though I think I'm fairly worldly, and I think I, I, I have a good understanding of how things work, um, there were some blinders that I had that, that Miles helped me to erase from my. So when I did a press press conference, what he what he suggested was that I I start with compassion, and and basically start by saying. This is a tragedy for everybody involved. And there's, there's no good that's going to come from this. And, and that people have a right to be angry. So I said that those things. But I probably wouldn't have said it. I probably would have been a little bit more law and order, just left my own devices. But that had such a huge effect. And it really resonated with people that felt like they had been harmed. And they it taught me a lot. And, and even I'm a psychologist, that's my training. But even then, you forget sometimes the power of empathy. Empathy is a monstrously powerful tool. Yeah. Um, just to switch, switch gears a little bit, Bill, sure. thank you for those insights. It's, uh, it's always nice to know a bit of the inner workings of why good things happen. My question is about uh, folks mind. that are folks that are homeless, and I'd like to get your, I guess, personal insights as to what we, as a city, uh, whether it be Alcohol or San Diego in general, what do you feel are some of the things that we can do better to help these people that are homeless? Good question. Good question. So I can answer that question. And I uh, warn you in advance that I, I will be controversial, as I often am. <laughs> um, homelessness is something that I feel 
like I have um, some experience in talking about. I, um, I told you I was a psychologist, um, also uh, an RN. And so I had, a, I had a really interesting job. For 15 years, I worked in the emergency room doing psychiatric evaluations and in Paradise Valley Hospital, which is inner city hospital now in Manchester City. And a big part of my job was dealing with homeless folks because the homeless community kind of goes on this migration from one site. They'll be on the streets for a couple of days, though. They'll use drugs and alcohol, they'll run out of money, they'll come to a psych hospital and say I'm suicidal. Uh, we have to admit them. They get out, they go to the next site hospital, and they just bounce around the city until they, they hit all the hospitals. And so we all knew them by name. Uh, I knew all my regulars, probably 50 people that, that would regularly come in. And we talked, I talked to the other doctors at the other uh, emergency rooms. And, Sometimes, sometimes we call each other and say, hey, Charlie's gonna be, gonna be here later today because he was just here, we just kicked him out. And he said he, was, he called the cops to pick him up in the lobby of my hospital so they could take him to your hospital. And <laughs> funny story, I, I don't wanna take too much time. I had, I had this guy who was doing that all day at once. And we were, he had been to nine different hospitals. From nine different, uh, ambulance rides, he probably spent $300,000 that day. I fi finally ended up at my hospital last. I knew it, but I said, why are you here? What's going on? He goes, I just hate the food. And, and, and I, I goes, I go to this board, I live in this Filipino board and care, and all they serve me is lupia, and I can't stand it anymore. I said, so, <laughs> but how do you say that? So a lot of people come out of the homeless, problem uh, from a very kind place. And that's if we can get them enough blankets, if we can get them a, a, enough medicine, if we can get them enough opportunities to get off the streets, that the problem will be resolved. And I, I think a lot of that comes from a misguided understanding of what homelessness is. If you believe that is due to people losing their jobs and being down to their luck, that model works. But when I was working in the emergency room, I gave up trying to get homeless folks off the streets because I had plenty of opportunity to get them off the streets. They didn't want that. Because if you, if you put them in a program, they couldn't use drugs, they couldn't drink, they couldn't have their dog with them. It's a lifestyle that they've chosen. And, and it all revolves around addiction to drugs and alcohol. So in answer to your question, we have to agree, agree as a society what the root cause of this problem is. And we have to attack that root cause. But we're not gonna agree because like everything else we're seeing, everything is affected by these left versus right politics. So global warming, right? It, it, it shouldn't be an issue. Either scientifically it's, it's valid or, or it's not. But we, we know that the science is corrupted by politics. Mm. Just like a lot of this thing with wearing masks or shutting down. You know, there's, there's good arguments on both sides that they're just diametrically opposed. What's up, let's just finish that, I'll give it. So if, if you may be king today and I could do whatever I um, I would stop giving the homeless $1,000 at the beginning of every month. I'd stop letting them go into psychiatric hospitals carte blanche. I'd make them have to live with their decision, but I'd offer lots and lots of opportunities to get clean and get off the streets. But the problem is people don't want to get clean. They don't want to get off the streets because they get an SSI check on the first every month. They can go in a hospital anytime they want to get off the street for a couple of days. And they enjoy this kind of transient lifestyle between living free under a bridge and then coming in and being taken care of by the, by the government. And so until we stop doing that, I don't think we're going to solve it. I mean, the reason I bring it up too is uh, we have a son who's schizophrenic, and I think that I think that's probably a subset of the group you're talking about. There are a few schizophrenics that are on the streets, but for the most part, in my emergency room, 
if a, if a schizophrenic person came and said, I don't know how to get help or I'm, they're too disorganized, they, they, if you told them to go to the bus station, they, they wouldn't, in a million years, couldn't figure out how to do that. There are lots of opportunities I had to get those folks out of the streets. And for the most part, uh, schizophrenics live in board cares or independent living facilities, which is not a panacea, but it's, uh, I think it's a misunderstanding that a, a large majority of the people on the streets are suffering from schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. It's really a fairly small majority. And even those usually have the, uh, the comorbidity of drug and alcohol use. It's really the drug and alcohol use that, that is that blocking point. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that your son has schizophrenia. That's it. Schizophrenia to me is the hardest diagnosis. Yeah, there's not a lot of great success stories with it. It's it's medication so, has proved uh, the therapy is superficial. It's tough. Yeah, it, 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 it really is. I I used to teach my students why I taught psych um, that I would rather deal with my son coming home and saying he had a cancer diagnosis than diagnosis. Yeah, it's a little more finite. Uh, anyway, thank you for sharing. Uh, God bless your son, Al. We'll pray for him. Craig. Very well. Let me ask you, you are king for a day. Yeah. How do you get people off the street? Do you understand me? Like, like, because what I'm hearing you say, it's a, it's a one size does not fit all. And a lot of people want this lifestyle. So but let's assume you had coercive powers. Tell me what you would do. I'd have to be king for about a couple of years uh, because it's it, it's a hugely tangled up mess. Um, we closed all the site, we closed all the long-term psychiatric facilities and state hospitals back in, in Reagan's day. And to be to be fair, it really wasn't Reagan's fault. Um, there was these new psychiatric medications that came out of um, uh, antipsychotic medications type one antipsychotics that Cambridge, everybody came out and said, we've cured schizophrenia. It's not going to be a problem anymore. And you can, you, at the same time that movie, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest came out in the, in the early 70s. And so there was this massive upwelling of political pressure to close those hospitals. So between the scientific community saying, you don't need these hospitals anymore because you have medicines, and the social active community saying it's barbaric to keep people locked up in these hospitals. We decided that the smart thing to do would be to discharge all these people from the state hospital and let them live in small independent living and board care facilities where they have no supervision, no trained staff, and they wander around the streets all the time. It was one of the most monumentally stupid things that government has ever done. So the first thing I would do is reinstitute the state hospitals. <laughs> um, then I would uh, deal with the, the LPS laws. Um, LPS. LPS stands for Latterman Petrus Short. It's the Latterman Petrus Short. It, those are the uh, uh, legislators that brought the, it. It's the, the laws that govern conservatorship. And 5150, 5150s are involuntary psychiatric goals. Um, they're so lenient, they're, they're so progressive that basically it's almost impossible to get somebody treatment unless they are so psychotic that they can't even put two words together. If, if, if you got somebody that, that's psychotic, but if you have somebody who's hearing voices telling them to kill people, um, if you have people that are, you know, occasionally jumping off buildings, um, as long as they, as long as at some point they can say, "Oh, I'm not going to jump off buildings anymore," uh, they let them go. And so I would, I would tighten up those laws. Um, then I would have a centralized psychiatric clearinghouse in every major city, so the patients can't go from one hospital to another. They have to go to one psychiatric. psychiatric they'll know this. This patient very well, and they'll say, you know what, you're just using this as a hotel or as a respite. We're not going to let you do that. And then I would make sure everybody had a payee, so that when they got their Social Security check, that a payee would only allow that Social Security check to be paid for for uh, housing, 
and medications and food, but you can't use it to buy drugs and alcohol. When you say payee, what book? I'm sorry. In the, in the psychiatric world, sometimes if somebody gets placed on conservatorship, um, Carlos. Well, you say so everybody should have a conservatorship to monitor money. I got it. Yeah, well, payee is not really conservatorship, but sometimes if, if Carlos you know, continues to spend all his money on cocaine for the first two days and then he's then he's destitute for the next 28 days we'll, we'll put kathy in charge of his money and so she'll she'll pay for his uh hotel or his work care but she's not going to pay for his cocaine. okay so everybody's got a de facto financial yeah and then and then i would do what we've done in alcohol um and i know people might challenge me on this because they you see, you see these tents pop up. But in alcohol, we don't allow any sleeping on the street. We don't allow any tents. We don't allow, allow any, any uh, sleeping bags. We, uh, to be completely honest, we harass them until they leave. And the NAACP may, or not, the, uh, the uh, ACLU may eventually keep threatening. You know, we have a tent city downtown. And it's, it's, there's a, it's an epidemic. It's yeah. horrible. It's, and, and it's third world. world. It's third world. And it's actually, uh, you know, but the problem is, I always get the impression that these people are not totally um, disabled. Let me put it that way. You said when I, you know, very, very funny. A lot of it's met, crystal methamphetamines. That, that's, the, that's the number one problem. And if you've ever seen anybody on crystal meth for a long time, they tend to get kind of crazy and disorganized. But a lot of times they'll come back if they stop using the drugs. So, um, didn't they close facilities downtown? What's that? Didn't they close facilities downtown? They did for a while. So now they've opened up some new ones, bought some hotels. Now they're, now they're renting motels. See, the, the, this is such a long topic. Yes. You'd be astonished? Yes. No, no, my question. If they do that for the homeless, what about the business guy who lost his job and not working is living out of his car? Do they have the same facility help as the homeless? Uh, yeah, we have lots of, we, like in, in alcohol, we have a, a couple million dollars set aside for rental assistance. So if you lost your job and you, and you need some, some money short, for a short-term bridge to, to, so you don't lose your house, we have money for that. And they, it's not enough. You know, it's funny. We have cities that uh, the people that work with me they're actually afraid to go to the cars oh it's yeah, i mean it's like you don't you know you actually have to be a company it's well really, let me kind of kind of scary let me tell you about about the other in, in this there's a there's a movement in california and most blue states to want to dismantle the punishment system the, the prison the prison system and they want to make crimes not punishable um, so some of the things that we've done in California is um, you can no longer be arrested for selling drugs. You can, you can definitely no longer be arrested for using drugs. Um, most assaults, you don't get arrested. If you steal anything less than $950, you cannot be arrested. All you can do is get a ticket. So if, if you went to Best Buy and you sold a computer, a laptop that was 780 bucks, um, all that would happen to you is if you got caught, the police officer would come and say, don't do that. Again. Don't do that. You have, you have ID. And of course they say, no, I don't have ID. And they say, well, here's a ticket. What's your name? John Doe. Here's a ticket. Show up at court. And they take the ticket. They throw it in the trash. And they, so the, the government in Sacramento is hell-bent upon emptying the prisons and decriminalizing most crimes. So it makes it much more difficult for local law enforcement to try to clean clean areas up because what what do these people have to lose? They, they there is no incentive to change your behavior. So are you running for governor? You running for governor? <laughs> are you running for governor? If you can help me raise fifty million dollars, I, I do in the heart. I I figure you know I I kind of get the sense that God put me in this post as being mayor, and that's where I'm going to stay. Um, I did run for Congress uh, two years ago, and uh, I dropped out when uh, Terrell Issa ran because 
I knew he would beat me badly like a drum. And, um, but he's a good man too. So he, he and I agreed together that I would drop out and support him. The way I'm, the way I'm trying to do my political life, and I'm not always successful, but the way I'm trying to do it is to always do the right thing, to not be afraid, to do what, to say and do what I have to, have to say and do regardless of how it's gonna affect my next election and to trust in God. And so that's, uh, it's worked out really great so far, but I don't know, you know, two years from now they may throw me out. So. Thank, you. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you for coming. I just want to know, is there anybody on Zoom that needs to ask uh, our mayor a question? Just raise your hand or chime in. Ask the tough questions. <laughs> yeah. You guys, are, you guys are pretty tough. Yeah, we, we have a couple people on Zoom. Um, well, I just, again, want to say thank you for coming, Mayor. And we believe we have... David Porta. Excuse me? David Porta. Oh, say the, say the name again real loud. David Porta from Walmart Executive. Oh, yes, our Walmart CEO. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we could be together, Lord. And I just thank you for your mighty hand in our world and in our country, Lord. And I pray going forward as San Diego County will continue being protected, Lord, from the evils. And I pray for all the leaders in this church and our entrepreneurs that are present, Lord. And thank you for your goodness and mercy and just protect each one of us as we do our chores that we need to have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks. All right. I, of course, I got to run my wife's baby in the car. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.